delighted to be with you today. <clears throat> Thank you, Meta, for organizing this. What I'd like to do in about uh, roughly about 35 minutes is to give you an overview of premature mortality. So, I, in fact, your title is not too far off from the eventual title I chose, which is How to Live Forever, but really not forever, well, almost forever. <laughs> and I'll start with my conclusions, which are that, which are really two. The first is that there's been extraordinary declines in premature mortality in the 20th century, and these suggest that with proper research and application, we might continue to get extraordinary declines in the 21st century. And the second is to tell you that the basic epidemiological work and the risk factor work that certainly that I do, quantifying the death, describing the causes of death, is actually central to meeting these 21st challenges. And I'll do so by describing the evolution of mortality over the last 200 years and then turn to the specific examples from India focusing on reductions in child deaths but increases in ischemic heart disease deaths. And then in the last part, I'll talk about what <coughs> are some of the key risk factors for premature adult mortality and what we know and conclude with probably the most important risk factor, the most actionable risk factor, which is tobacco smoking. So in this talk, I'm going to give you a lot of numbers, and I apologize, you know, the criticism of of epidemiologists is that we're number crunchers, just like accountants. Uh, that's not quite fair. Accountants have more personality than epidemiologists. Um, but what I want to do is to give you a quantitative sense of what I'm doing, but without a lot of numbers. So let's start with the very basic uh, idea, which is the avoidability of death over time. So this fellow here, um, Edmund Haley, in between waiting for uh, for <coughs> for comets to, to come by and doing other astronomy, dabbled in one of the first what's called the light table. So you got some data from Breslau, Germany, a closed population in which they had all births recorded and they uh, recorded all the deaths. And he drew a simple, what's now called a, a life table, which is survival shown on the y-axis by age on the x-axis. And you see that in Germany in the 1700s and England in the 1860s were very similar in that something like 30% of all those born would be dead before 10. And by age 70, very few were alive, you know, around 20% or less were alive by age 20. But, and that didn't, uh, that hasn't very much been different throughout human history. If you go back and look at the limited records from Rome, they describe very similar patterns. If really right up until um, about 1860 or so, these were the patterns worldwide. But look what happened in the UK. In the UK, the Registrar General started recording births and deaths in many parts of the uh, UK starting about 1860, so they could produce these life tables. And what you see is by 1860, uh, by 1860, it was very much the patterns I just described for Germany earlier. But by 1910, child mortality had been halved. So only 20% or so of kids born would be dead before age 10. But still, very small proportion, maybe a third of the people would be able to live till um, age um, 70. And my definition of middle age, which I'm going to emphasize a lot in this talk, is approximately age 30 to 69. It changes as I grow older, but I'm going to stick to <laughs> roughly 30 to 69. So you see what happened between 1910 and 1960 in the UK was the elimination or the near elimination of childhood mortality. So death before age 10 basically became a rare event. Uh, but still, in 1960, if you ask, well, what proportion of 70, uh, what proportion of those born 
would reach age 70. It is still only about 60%. And subsequent to that has been the revolution in particularly in cardiovascular uh, mortality, but also reductions in smoking attributable deaths. So now it's the case in the UK, but also in Canada and the US, um, about 80% of those born can expect to reach age 70. And if you stratify this, as I'll show you later by smokers, smokers would be close to about 90%, uh, or sorry, non-smokers would be close to 90% survival, and the smokers would be well below 80%. So this gives a framework of thinking about the evolution of Why is it just mortality. male? Hmm? Why is it just male? Because uh, these are the data that are, uh, uh, they're analyzed for smoking effects. Males are easier to study, as I'll show you later, but it's a very similar pattern for females. Okay, so this gives a framework for also thinking, well, where are other countries in this uh, this cycle or this comparison. So uh, if you look at contemporary England or the, or Canada, then that gives you a sense again, about 80% of those born would reach age 70. But in China, it's increased substantially. China also has low child mortality rates now, but only about 70%, uh, not 80% of those born will reach age 70. In Ethiopia and India, it's still about 50%. So one of the major challenges is to reduce childhood mortality, as I'll show you, on which there's extraordinary progress, but also mortality in middle age, on which there's less progress. So for turning first to child mortality, in 1950, about a quarter of all the children born worldwide would be dead before their fifth birthday. By 2016, that's down to 5%. And now still, what's happened is the number of births has increased, so the overall number of deaths uh, of children has uh, continued to be substantial. It's about 6 million. But one way to look at that is saying, well, if the childhood mortality rates that were observed in, 19th or, uh, in 1900 in the US or in Canada, were even higher than those, you know, they were close to a third. If they were applicable worldwide, you would actually get about 30 million child deaths. Now, conversely, if the child death rates that we have in Canada today were applicable worldwide, you would only get 1 million child deaths out of the 140 million. So it shows you the progress, but also how much further we need to go. Now, to go back to what explains this remarkable transformation of mortality. Well, prior to 1950 and after 1950 are very different uh, reasons. So prior to 1950, it dealt with very much basic discoveries on the control of infectious diseases. So very simple things like figuring out the modes of transmission for measles, um, for cholera, and you, many of you have probably heard of the uh, noted epidemiologist, John Snow, who was investigating cholera outbreaks in, in Soho in London, and uh, concluded that the uh, main source was one pump. And when he removed the handle, the cholera cases declined substantially. Now that's important because if you look at the literature as to what was prescribed back then, they had all sorts of wacky ideas so it's not just in this era where we you know, face people like Jenny McCarthy and uh, wacky ideas, Dr. Oz or um, others. In that time, the, uh, the, Indian, uh, the British Army's instructions in India were to say in the presence of a cholera epidemic, they should march at 90 degrees to the wind. Because they had no idea where it was coming from. So this basic understanding of transmission was actually quite key to reducing the spread of infections. Quarantine methods came in, sanitation improvements, and then in, much more in the biomedical area, <laughs> the discovery of uh, basic vaccines, the smallpox vaccine that Jenner developed from cows was used quite widely and uh, right up until uh, the late 19th century. And increasingly more and more 
uh, both vaccines, but particularly drugs became available. For example, streptomycin was used to treat TB. Now, after 1950, however, it's a very different scenario that it was much more, the changes have been due to particularly biomedical products, which broadly uh, include control of infectious diseases. So that includes the eradication of smallpox, um, the extended program on immunization, which did a very simple thing that in 1970, about 3% of the world's children had complete vaccination. And a group met in, in uh, I believe it was in Italy, and said, well, this is ridiculous. Why is it so low? So WHO announced this program where they were trying to get every country to expand routine immunization. And now about 85% of the world has, world's children have these three routine vaccines. And in the process, it's avoided you know, several millions of child deaths a year. Oral rehydration was came out of research in Bangladesh, and it just showed that for a child dying of diarrhea, you, they don't need to die. You can use a simple solution that will uh, reduce mortality. And malaria control outside of Africa has been an extraordinary success. So there's some examples that you can see here, basically in a simple thing of before 19, um, basically the modern uh, epidemiological and public health era, what were surveys done? So in 1875, they, when surveys were done of cities, American Public Health Association was asking about things like gas and lighting and cemeteries and burial. Now again, not very solid knowledge of the transmission and look at what happened by 1921. They were asking about infant hygiene, contagious diseases, uh, vaccination, pasteurization of milk, so this extraordinary change, which we sometimes take for granted, has really uh, risen because modern public health concurrently developed. Now, what about <clears throat> these? Um, the title of this talk was supposed to be about, um, it was supposed to include pandemics. And the key point I'd like to make here is that the routine is more important than the dramatic in terms of the absolute numbers of deaths. We do worry about things like Ebola. We worry about a pandemic of H, uh, uh, for example, avian influenza. And that is justified because worldwide, what happened? Well, roughly, the in many countries, the death rates double, but for a year and a half or so. So this happened, for example, with influenza and some interesting work in India. So for a year, the death rates double. Um, but they came back down. And that would be certainly the course of any other pandemic that we might face. You can think, with, of course, it would be a catastrophe. But look at the scope of things. If you look at all the wars, famine, natural disasters, World War I, World War II, it's about 200 million. It includes 20 million Russians just in World War II. But compare that to about 2 billion childhood deaths that have occurred in the 20th century. So the progress in terms of avoidable mortality will come from diligence to these, avoidance of war, but mostly it'll come from focusing on the routine causes. Now, <clears throat> I want to illustrate how remarkable this transformation, which I showed you, has occurred, uh, and make the point of how resilient it is. Um, and I'm going to do so by comparing uh, worms to English men. <laughs> so what uh, what you see on the top here is some experiments done on C. elegans, which is a particular type of worm, which is the best biologic species uh, or best studied biologic species. It was the first to have its uh, <laughs> genome sequenced. We know so much about it. The basis of things like program cell death have all come from studying this this worm. So if you look at the wild type survival. The typical wild type, meaning the natural type, the typical survival is that they only live to about 20 days. Now, some crazy scientists decided, well, what if we go through and we knock out various genes, particularly the lipid genes that are responsible for maintaining the cell structure uh, or the outside of the cell? And they did a series <coughs> of experiments, and sure enough, they were able to 
do something that would basically triple the life expectancy of this worm. But it took about, in worm terms, it took about uh, three generations or actually five generations of research to get this, in about 60 days. And moreover, the, when you look at the mutation, um, it was very fragile. So if you change the pH or change some parameters, you would actually go back to the earlier death rates. So it, it makes the point that the best we've been able to do in biologic science, you know, the mad scientist that says, I'm going to change how uh, species live, is been matched or exceeded by what has been done in public health. This extraordinary transformation has occurred. Moreover, worms are, aren't as durable as Englishmen, and Englishmen <laughs> have now uh, survived the subsequent uh, pestilence that occurs. For example, um, as I'll show you, <coughs> the particular challenges of cardiovascular disease. So in public health, we really should be thinking about this. Now, if you apply the newest technology, CRISPR technology, and think, okay, I'm going to do the same and take out all of this, you'll probably end up with a very similar result. So the durability of public health has actually been extraordinary. Okay, now let's turn to the last roughly 40 years, because we want a bit more contemporary look. And what I'm showing you here is a pretty simple graph. Um, which I know it looks like kind of sperm trying to swim to their targets, <laughs> but what it is showing is the world stratified by World Bank region. So you have world low income, lower middle income, upper and high income, and then the different age groups. And it's basically showing you survival uh, or the percentage dead um, uh, over time. So what is shown here is 50 to 69 worldwide trends. That's down substantially. Zero to 49 is down substantially. Five to 49 was coming down substantially, but had a little peak or had a little plateau, I should say. And that's the effect of the HIV AIDS epidemic, as I'll show you here. Mm -hmm. So in low income countries, where you can look at this more particularly, you see extraordinary declines in child mortality, such that um, for example, in, in upper middle income countries, their child mortality is now at the level, close to le the level, um, at which the high income countries were in 1970. That's called the convergence. But there's been one important exception here, and you see a little blip here in high income countries, which is the effect of AIDS, and here in low income countries, which is also the effect of AIDS. Um, okay, let's break this down. Now we can look not at the global level, but at the country level. And we, what we've done is 25 most populous countries. And this is now child mortality. And you see this very similar pattern, just striking reductions. I mean, look at the decline in Egypt, 1970, but 25% of all children born would be dead. You know, that's down to now about 5%, just a huge decline. Uh, Turkey is similar. You, in Congo, and to a lesser extent in South Africa, you see this little blip. That, again, is the effect of AIDS. Let's go to the next AIDS group, 5 to 49. Again, you see extraordinary declines in most populations, but with the exceptions. And what are the exceptions? Well, South Africa, that's the effect of AIDS, mm -hmm. went up and then came down. And similarly, in other parts, uh, some parts of Africa, in Russia, it's vodka, as I'll show you in some detail. Um, in Thailand, interestingly, this increase was partially AIDS, but it was also rash driving, just crazy driving. In Iran, this is the Iran-Iraq war. And after the Iraq war ended, boom, big declines occurred. So extraordinary progress has occurred overall, except for war, vodka, and HIV. What about at 50 to 69? Well, the death rates are, of course, uh, the probability of death is higher, uh, but you see also extraordinary progress. And earlier I showed you Iran. Look at the extraordinary progress that had occurred. And again, the exceptions are some late effects of HIV. This is the, in Russia, this is the Russian vodka crisis. But for the most part, extraordinary declines have occurred. 
Okay, so at 1970 rates, if you think the, the big message of epidemiology and demography over the last 200 years is pretty simple. Death early in life should be rare and death in middle age need not be common anywhere. And we are getting to this, we're in the midst of this extraordinary uh, transformation that in 1970, 40% of males and 50% of females would be dead. Uh, would on, well, only 40% or 50% would live to 70. By 2010, that's up substantially. And the question is, can we get to what I showed you earlier, about the 80% survival as we have in Canada? Now, this would require a 40% death rate, a cut in death rates by 2030, which is possible, uh, as I'll show you. But what it requires is then a very hard look as what is needed to cut global death rates. Well, one of the important things, and certainly much of my research has been on the most obvious, which is we don't know how most people in the world die. Most of the deaths that occur in low and middle income countries are at home, and they don't have medical attention like occurs at, in Canada. So for example, only 3% of the world's kids who died in 2010 had a properly completed death certificate. So in the absence of having all deaths registered and having them in the hospital, what kind of solutions do we have to figure out who dies and from what? Let's go back in time. And there was a solution suggested almost 140 years ago by the sanitary commissioner of the government of India. And I'll let you read this, but basically he says, for sanitary purposes, it is indispensable to know the relative mortality in small and well-defined tracts to ascertain the death rates in each of these communities and to apply the remedies. That's more or less what we're doing with the million death study in India. So the million death study involves working with the Registrar General of India and it has an approach of taking one million homes that are selected after the preceding census. So you do the census and you randomly select, like a poll, 8,000 areas with about a million homes, with about 7 million people. And then you, we've trained now, it's actually now 900 non-medical surveyors to knock on the door every six months and find out who's born, who's died, and if a death occurs, they fill out a simple two-page form that includes a half-page local language narrative on what occurred. So it's a medical description of the circumstances leading to death. And then we turn those into electronic records, and we've got 400 doctors coding online that uh, these records, each of them goes to two doctors. And the two doctors have to agree on the classification of death and they have to assign some key words. If they disagree, they get each other's data anonymously. And if they continue to disagree, we get a senior person to adjudicate. And the approach is to do study all diseases, work within the government, and to keep cost very low. So this entire study costs less than a dollar uh, per home per year. It's uh, really quite cheap. And now it's able to do things like move to electronic entry, and you can do GPS tracking of the field work, which is actually quite interesting. So in some pilot work that we did in one area, um, we got these GPS readings. And we're curious as to, well, why is this fellow, that wasn't one of the houses. And it turns out when we looked, the surveyor admitted that no, he actually didn't uh, do the survey. He just went and sat in a little roadside restaurant there and had a very nice paratha and, uh, uh, fake the field work. So, so, you know, you can find people out saying, why were you there? And he, said, he did say it was a really good parata. It was worth it, so. so what have we learned from the million death study? Well, it's a simple adage. You don't know until you look. And every major condition that we expected one broad answer, we got surprises. So, for example, we've documented that about between 4 to 12 million girls um, have been aborted before birth in the last three decades, and half of these just in the last decade. As I'll show you, we've shown a million smoking deaths, which is about three times what WHO had estimated. Um, and snake bite deaths is a nice 
interesting finding. We showed that the Indian snake bite death total was 50,000 in 2005. That was WHO's worldwide total. And as a result, WHO has revised their estimates upwards to 100,000. But more importantly, they said snake bite is on the list of neglected tropical diseases which could be eliminated. So that's actually quite uh, rewarding to know. So let's give you the examples of what we've known, what we've discovered recently for child mortality. So this is a paper that is just out in the Lancet, and it looks at the 2000-2015 changes for under five mortality, and basically in three time periods, kind of the early part, 2000-2005, then five to 10 and 10 to 15. And around 2005, Manmohan Singh, the former prime minister, introduced a national health mission, which said we, India has to tackle basic public health. And we added, and they added a set of interventions. So we were thinking there would be acceleration of most of the declines. And in fact, that's what you see, that most of the conditions were following at a faster annual rate in the more contemporary time periods than in the earlier. So for example, in the first month of life, which is neonatal, the neonatal infections were down two thirds, birth asphyxia, birth trauma by even greater, tetanus down by 90%. But as I'll show you, it's not all good news. Term births with low birth weight rose in rural areas and in the poorer states. At the 159 month, it was much more even news, much uh, uh, great progress on most of the conditions. And this is just shown schematically. So pneumonia, diarrhea, measles, and um, meningitis, and cephalitis all down substantially. And you note, however, the decline in malaria is much less. And that reason is basically malaria was neglected in relative terms during this program. So in the first month of life, big declines in infections, and in birth asphyxia trauma. That's basically complications from not enough oxygen during the time of delivery. But term births with low birth weight, which reflect maternal factors and things like maternal tobacco chewing actually increased. So, uh, but at one to 59 months, the ammonia and diarrhea, two big killers increased or decreased so fast, particularly in girls, that the boy-girl gap has narrowed in India, which is actually quite historic. Okay, back to the first month, you see, yes, uh, prematurity and low birth weight going up nationally, but that's driven by increases in rural areas and in the poorer states. In the rich areas or rich states and the urban areas, even that condition is improving. So we need to understand why this discrepancy occurs and that's further research ongoing. Okay, so that's good news. India's reduced its child mortality by about 40%. The, what we've estimated is the National Health Mission has saved at least a million lives in, since 2005 when it was implemented. Um, but there's also bad news in our data, and particularly what we've noted is ischemic heart disease um, at all ages is actually increasing in India in contrast to declines in the US, UK, Canada, and both in men and women, but particularly in men. And it's increasing particularly in the rural areas. Again, a bit of a surprise. You'd expect, well, it's urbanization that drives ischemic heart disease. You move to the city, you stop exercising as, or stop moving around as much, you gain weight, you don't have as uh, balanced a diet, <coughs> um, and you get uh, heart disease. Well, it suggests there's things going on in rural India that we don't quite understand. Moreover, what we showed was that the patterns of stroke and ischemic heart disease were very distinctive. Ischemic heart disease is very much concentrated in southern India and up in the north in Punjab. Um, but stroke is particularly high in the northeast. So in a few states in the northeast, which account for a third, sorry, a sixth of the population, they account for a third of the total stroke deaths in the country. And it's a very different pattern. If you look at the age specific patterns in nationally for ischemic heart disease, the rates are going up at every age group between 30 to 69, more or less in men and in women. In 
for stroke in those northeast states, they're also going up. You know, the squiggly lines mean they're smaller numbers, so they're a little uncertain. But the general trend is that they're also rising. But the stroke in the rest of the country, in the non-high burden states, which is basically all these areas here, I can show you that, is actually decreasing. Now, why is that? Uh, we don't know. This is, it suggests that risk factors um, really are important to try to understand. And what we do know, however, is the large proportion and an increasing proportion of the men and women described a previous history of having heart disease or stroke. So what that suggests is that these conditions are probably under-treated. They're diagnosed and people don't die of their first heart attack, but because they have a first heart attack and they don't get treated aggressively, as would be the case here, and as a consequence, get a subsequent fatal event. So what's an example of good treatment? Well, this applies worldwide, this evidence, which your pedo has shown, which is a very simple idea. If you take anyone who's had a previous heart attack or stroke, and you say, okay, um, you have a choice. If you take three pills, which is an aspirin, a blood pressure pill, and a statin, doesn't matter in which sequence you take them. Well, effectively, you can take your one-year event rate, an event rate I mean dropping dead or being hospitalized with a heart attack or stroke, from 7% down to 2%, just with three drugs. So in 10 years, what that means is I can go from a one in two chance of dropping dead or going to the hospital to a one in six chance. So it's actually quite remarkable. And this evidence certainly uh, does apply to Indian populations. And we know that it is possible to reduce key risk factors. For example, if you lower your systolic blood pressure, this is worldwide, by 20 uh, millimeters. You, know, you go from 140 to 120. 50% you know, less vascular risk. If uh, you lower your lipids, which is hard by diet, but reasonably easy with statins, by two uh, millimoles, then you have 50% less. Now, overweight, at least we know only from high-income countries, that if you have 10 units higher BMI, that's um, if there's overweight, 10 units uh, will have less BMI if you reduce the BMI. But this is so far evidence only in high income. In India, the relationship might actually be very different. Okay. So um, I just thought this was amusing. These two cavemen sitting around and they're pontificating as to why their survival is so low. You know? And it's important again to go back that we, um, it's, yes, these key risk factors are, are important for quality of life. But for longevity, we, as far as we know, it's really just uh, exercise that is the key driver. And I want to show you some evidence turning to risk factors that supports that. So what are the big risk factors that we should be concerned about? So I'll, there's a few, and I just want to illustrate uh, them by, for example, looking at smoking, drinking, illicit drugs, uh, and obesity, which is defined as BMI over 30 we can say Toronto has a unique uh, experience that our um, a former mayor, um, our late former mayor, actually had all of these risk factors. Um, but of those... How old is he now? Huh? How old is he's, he's dead. He's so. dead. Rob Ford. Oh, yeah, Rob, Rob Ford. Ford. I thought you meant Rob Lassen. No, no. Rob <laughs> Ford uh, yeah. had all of these risk okay, factors. Yeah. Um, but And the key driver, although his particular cancer wasn't uh, clearly associated with smoking, it, it probably was the, the biggest risk factor. So let me go through each of these, uh, and I'll start with obesity as the comparison. So, so the obesity to smoking comparison. So as I'll show you, now the 21st century evidence suggests that a typical smoker loses a decade of life if they start early in life and they don't quit, which is the typical pattern of chronic smokers in in Canada, they don't quit, they lose a decade of life. Mm -hmm. Now, to get that same decade of life lost, you have to actually have quite high levels of uh, obesity. In my case, I'd have to put on 50 kilograms, you know, well over 100 pounds, to get 
the same loss of life to get a BMI of around uh, 30 or so, or sorry, around 43 to get that loss of life of 10 years. So, and even in the US or in parts of Canada, we don't have many people that are at that extreme levels of, of uh, body mass. But more moderate body mass index of you know, around 32, you know, which is an extra roughly 30 kilo, uh, 30 kilograms of me, 25 kilograms of me, would mean about a three year loss of life. So if you then do the maths and you think, well, roughly um, something like 30% of Canadians are described as having uh, higher uh, than ideal BMI and they lose three years of life. Well, that's uh, just under a year off life expectancy. But if 20% of Canadians smoke, it's a little less now, and they lose a decade, that's two years off average life expectancy. So smoking remains far more important than adiposity currently. Now that's very different. Childhood adiposity that's sustained throughout life might have bigger risks. This is mostly adult. And it's not to say you shouldn't take action on obesity. And one of the things that I think is emerging is uh, as compelling evidence is uh, tax on sugary uh, drinks, not on all carbonated drinks, but on sugary uh, drinks. That's emerging as a, as a powerful way of reducing obesity. Okay, and moreover, as I showed you, we know much of the mechanisms that lead to higher vascular death. Most of the excess you see there what is, is not from cancer. Death? Hmm? What is vascular death? Uh, vascular disease? Heart attack and stroke. Okay. Most of the excess in from uh, adiposity is related to heart attack and stroke. And we know the mechanisms. It leads to higher blood pressure, leads to higher bad cholesterol, lower good cholesterol, more diabetes. And one of the key messages, though, is that we have ways of actually treating each of these, which are actually remarkably effective. Okay, let's turn to alcohol. And as I showed you, the extraordinary fluctuations that have occurred in uh, Russia uh, are mostly driven by alcohol. And if you look at the probability under uh, age 50, you'll see that it actually um, is remarkably different, even in countries that don't have small amounts of alcohol consumption. They've uh, decreased the overall mortality. But in Russia, it was mainly the vodka that drove this. And the key message for alcohol is actually very simple. Just don't drink like a Russian male. <laughs> and to show this, I'll contrast what happens, um, what happened between Russia and the UK over time. So this is deaths between 15 to 54, where you really shouldn't have deaths at this age. You know, it should be low. And look at the UK rates, which is not a teetotaling country by any means. Uh, the British are known uh, for having substantial amounts of of alcohol, but nothing like the Russian pattern. And you see a decline over time. Now, prior to 1980, the differences are due mostly to tobacco, but after 1980, the fluctuations are due mostly to alcohol. And you see what happens here. The, the Russian uh, death rates were quite high, and in comes Mr. Gorbachev, and um, he didn't like to see so many drunken men all the time, so he had a policy to try to restrict it. Death rates went, went down. Then... Um, the Soviet Union collapses. In comes Boris Yeltsin, who you all remember, uh, who used to sell Yeltsin vodka in small caches in Red Square for cheaper than water. Um, and up goes the mortality rates. Mm -hmm. Then again, a second uh, more recent increase when the ruble collapsed. So these extraordinary fluctuations puzzled a lot of epidemiologists because there was an increase in overall death rates. And the assumption was that, well, even reasonably uh, heavy drinking shouldn't increase heart disease. It should be supposedly moderately pr uh, protective. But this was sorted out very nicely by a study by David Zaritze, where um, what he did is he surveyed in Siberia um, women uh, and men who were living spouses of men or women that had died. And if you want the truth about a Russian male's drinking, wait until he's dead and ask his wife. 
because that's when you get the truth of what they uh, what they drank. So here the comparisons are men who drank a bottle of vodka a day, and the controls are those that drank only uh, half a bottle a week. So they couldn't find any non-drinking controls, so they had to take controls that have 20 shots a week, which is extraordinary. But even with that in comparison, you see an increase in all of the major causes of death. And what was sorted out is that why were um, Russian men dropping dead from a heart attack? People, that didn't make sense, because alcohol is supposed to reduce, to some modest extent, uh, ischemic heart disease. But effectively, what they were doing is drinking so much that they got a arrhythmia um, and their heart stopped. And the Russian coding system was to code those as a heart attack. So this was sorted out very nicely, this study. Okay, so that's alcohol. Let me turn to another risk factor, which is a little more exotic, but uh, quite relevant, which is vegetarianism. So now, it turns out India is a great place to study vegetarianism because uh, most of the vegetarians are lacto-vegetarians, and they're lifelong lacto-vegetarians. So in the Million Death Study, we asked, was Dead Fred a lacto-vegetarian? And we also asked living respondent, are you a lacto-vegetarian, along with other questions on smoking, chewing alcohol. And what we have shown is that um, lacto-vegetarianism is actually a very stable exposure. If you look at the variation across states over time, the, it's a very stable uh, correlation of the levels of the population that are lacto-vegetarian, which is good, which is good for epidemiological uh, research. So. <clears throat> What do we find? Well, first let's turn to men. And the way we've done this is because there's differences between the dead and the living, obviously the dead will be older and they're more likely to smoke and chew uh, and drink alcohol. We've adjusted for those, but there's also going to be other differences, subtle differences. So the way we've done this is each of those seven or 8,000 areas that I mentioned, we've taken the controls from the same area. So it means you're actually uh, adjusting for other things. They, vegetarians and non-vegetarians will both go to the same place to buy their uh, vegetables, or if they eat meat, they'll have the same exposure to air pollution and so forth. And what you see here is, um, interestingly, a reduction in almost all of the digestive conditions. So anything greater than one, means vegetarianism is bad for you. Anything below is that it's protected. So overall, no effect. Vegetarians don't have any lower mortality in the men uh, than non-vegetarians. But it varies by disease. So you see some protective effects of digestive. Um, and not much for ischemic heart disease, but interestingly, protective effect for stroke. And a consistent excess for chronic lung disease now, when you go into the details of this, the digestive effect is basically explained by the residual confounding of their alcohol patterns, meaning the women are still lying about the husbands drinking even though, uh, even after death. So if you adjust for that, it actually goes away. But you don't get much of a protective, um, you don't get any real impact increase in vascular disease, uh, but you do a reduction in, in uh, in stroke. So it balances off, so there's no net impact. Now, this is where it gets interesting. Uh, for women, it's actually uh, quite different. So if we look at women, uh, first of all, overall, there's no clear protective effect from the digestive conditions. And, I'll, sorry, I'll come to this. Overall, there's a small excess, a 12% excess risk in women. It's a big percentage. It's 12%. It's That's not, a big it's not, if you did smoking, it'd be over here. So you have to look at it in the context of smoking, which I'll show you. So 12% excess is notable. And what's driving this? Well, it interestingly is higher rates of heart disease and of chronic lung disease um, and you know, some other medical conditions. And uh, now you think, well, what is going on here? So then, when we are looking into this, what appears to be the pattern is a very simple one. In a typical rural home, who will eat last 
it typically is the men, particularly the husbands, will sit and eat first, uh, or the children will eat first if they haven't eaten already, then the men, and then whatever is left over is what the women eat. So then if you then, if you look at the details, which we've started to do, you find that the women that um, particularly are wives uh, have the intake which comprises the most carbohydrates and the least protein, in fact, the least fats, and certainly very low levels of fruit and vegetable intake, fresh fruits and vegetable intakes. So what this is pointing to is not so much the protection of vegetarianism, or the excess of vegetarianism, because that is a relatively small risk, as I'll show you in comparison. But it's pointing to the deficiency of uh, the Indian diet, particularly for women. Just to summarize some of the findings, we seem to uh, see different patterns. In women, women vegetarians are different than male vegetarians, when you look at this uh, very carefully. Okay, so I'm going to carry on with risk factors. So I've talked about alcohol, uh, vegetarianism, obesity. Um, what about something even more wrong, like happiness? Well, um, or stress. And happiness and stress tend to go together. And Valerie Burrell and a team in the Million Women study asked a million women in the UK um, a few key questions and follow them over 10 years on, and then determine what they died from. And those that described at baseline, those that who were not already had a chronic illness, were they happy? Usually, sometimes, uh, most of the time. There was no relationship with subsequent deaths. And as I'll show you, contrast it to very simple things. Well, how much did they smoke? So a clear excess. So the best thing you can do is to be an unhappy non-smoker, at least in terms of, of risks. So <laughs> let's turn to smoking, because that is a big risk factor and a quantifiable one. So this is the 21st century hazards. Now, we've had 40,000 studies on smoking since about 1950 or so. But surprisingly, only in the last roughly five, six years have we got the 21st century hazards properly identified. And what that shows, as I documented earlier, is about a decade of life lost in typical smokers versus non-smokers after you take into account any other differences that occur in their education <laughs> levels, of, uh, alcohol patterns, obesity, health insurance access. So that's true in the UK men. That's Richard Dahl's last study um, among doctors. It's true in in UK women. This is true in the studies that I'll show you in the United States. It's true in atomic bomb survivors in Japan. And it's true in the men who smoke cigarettes in the million death study, about a decade of life lost. So it's a remarkable consistency that we see here. And good news and bad news on the smoking front from the New England Journal of Medicine, they state flat out smokers lose at least one decade of life expectancy over non-smokers on average. The encouraging news here is quitting before 40 reduces the smoking-related death risk by 90% compared to continuing on as a smoker. Great. That's 66 years of epidemiology in 22 <laughs> seconds. That's all you need to know. That's exactly what Brian Williams said. So this is our study from the US where we did this interesting setup they have, which I like to call death book, which is basically you survey people and then you link them to the National Death Index with their permission. And what we found was pretty simple, that women who smoked like men died like men. And the women who smoked had about three times higher risk of dying, the same as men. Now this is new because women did not usually smoke early in life and stay long-term smokers up until recently. That's really the core that if you watch that TV series, Mad Men, you see in the 60s is when women started smoking seriously like men in very high levels. And uh, men, many of them did not quit. And so we're able to study that only about 50 years later. Any studies prior to that actually had some misleading results. So what do we show here? Well, if you take 
the simple proposition that if you're a 25 year old in the US, can you live till age 80? You can't live forever, but can you live till age 80? Uh, and it's the case that among never smokers, 70% can. Among current smokers and women, only 38% do. So that's about a decade of life lost. And this is adjusting for differences between men and women. And you see that the differences occur early, even by age 50, there's a significant difference between the survival, and that's quite known by 60. Now, what we've understood is the evolution of the epidemic means that you have to study the populations that start early and don't quit. And if you are a smoker that wants to kill yourself, then the advice is start early and don't quit. But when we study this, you see that the early relationship, for example, of lung cancer and uh, the uh, age for smoking, non this is the ratios between smokers and non-smokers, was actually quite flat. And this is what the tobacco industry used as an argument, saying, well, look, what are you talking about? Smoking doesn't kill women. They smoke also. Uh, they're not dying. And the reason is that women had not been smoking long enough. So by 1982, uh, so forth, when the follow-up studies were done, the risk had increased, but still well short of the male risk. But by 2010 or so, they'd caught up. So now women and male risk are comparable. So this actually gives you a framework for understanding the evolution of the epidemic in developing countries. In When an increase in cigarettes smoking occurs, it'll be really about three, four decades after that, you'll see an increase in deaths. And China and India, in different ways, are already at this uh, level of about a million tobacco deaths. And China is a classic example. In the 1990s, 12% of all of the middle-aged male deaths were from, China, were from smoking. And thankfully, women in China don't smoke that much, and the smoking prevalence has gone down. So the female epidemic in China might well be aborted. But by 2010, it had increased to 20%, higher in urban than in rural. And as a benchmark, you look, well, where was the US? The US got to about, or Canada, it got to about a third as the peak. And Hong Kong, which started smoking about 20 years earlier, has also reached a third. So we can safely say by 2030s, a third of all the middle-aged deaths will be due to smoking based upon these projections. India, it's a little bit different and a bit surprising because Indian men start earlier or don't start as early in life and smoke fewer cigarettes or BDs, which is the locally manufactured cigarette, yet they have as extreme a loss, particularly for cigarettes. So smoke, men who smoke BDs lose six years. The few women who smoke BDs lose eight years. Men who smoke cigarettes lose 10 years of life. And in men, what's happened particularly is the cigarette has been displacing the BD. So if you look within the two time periods, the risks are actually getting steeper uh, with the more contemporary data, which is shown in the, in the black for almost all of the conditions. They're, and that's basically a cigarette displacing BD effect. Okay, so the good news is because the hazards of smoking are uh, so large, the benefits of stopping are also extremely large. So those that quit by age 30 on average get back almost all of the 10 years of lost life. Quit by 40, get back nine. Quit by 50, get back six. Even quitting by 60, gets you back about four years of life expectancy. And this is shown in the Million Women study. You see the reduction um, at the different ages of quitting. So take the 40-year-old uh, that quit. Many women in Canada and in the UK and US would be 40, and they think, oh, it's too late for me. I'm addicted. There'll be no benefit if I quit. And But in fact, they do have some residual excess. That's a 20% excess. But you have a 200% excess if you continue to smoke. So there's a big reduction versus continuing to smoke. And it applies to particular diseases of lung cancer. In populations that have quit seriously, it includes Canada, we have this extraordinary decrease that has occurred um, in overall mortality. So this is men 
who were earlier in the um, tobacco epidemic. They, in 1970, which is about when I moved to Canada, 38% of all men in Canada aged 35 would be dead before 70. And the smoking in the shaded constituted 14%, 14 out of those 38 men um, out of 100 would be due to smoking deaths. And you see the remarkable reduction. So now you take a 35 year old, only 16% of them will be dead before age uh, 70 and only 4% percent is because of smoking. So there's in fact a bigger decline in smoking atrial deaths than overall mortality. And this is relevant when you look, for example, in Ontario, just in the more recent times, there's been also extraordinary progress, overall 24% reduction in the risk of death just from 1992. And a lot of that is due to smoking, but not uh, that's not the only thing. If you just look at the differences between in the white part, uh, 25 minus 8 is uh, 17, and 19 minus 5 is 14. So the conditions not due to smoking are also improving. Things like treatment for heart attacks, uh, better access to, uh, to care. And we have an interesting comparison by looking at white men in the south, uh, to the south of us in the U.S. And here you see that the declines in smoking are actually comparable, about a 36% decline but they've had a much smaller decline in uh, overall mortality. Again, if you just do the differences at the top, look at the white part. That's 30 minus 11 is 19, and 25 minus 7 is 18. So not much change. And this is the stagnation of middle-aged mortality that now is increasingly described in the U.S. And we're doing some work that interestingly shows that if it weren't for tobacco control, those differences uh, the mortality uh, excess that you're seeing would be greater. And in fact, that's heavily concentrated in Republican voting areas. So in a strange way, tobacco control might have helped elect Donald Trump by keeping his voters alive. Okay, what works? What works to reduce the obvious uh, hazards of, uh, of smoking? Well, this is some work that I did for the World Bank and, and afterwards. And the key message was summarized recently in The Economist, which is, how do you cut smoking in poor countries? Tax. The single most effective intervention that reduces consumption is tax. So if you look in the UK, of all people, Margaret Thatcher in 1981 uh, had, had the biggest impact on uh, smoking by raising the taxes substantially. She didn't do it for health reasons, she did it for revenue. And in other countries, you have the simple rule that if you triple the price of cigarettes, you have the smoking, and as a nice benefit, the government gets more uh, more tobacco revenue. And for example, in France, you see this. In France, the number of cigarettes per day fell from, uh, consumed for uh, adult, fell from six to three, very rapidly in about 15 years. In contrast, it took in Canada about 35 years to go from 11 to about five cigarettes. But the French did it in 15 because they raised prices substantially. So this is Jacques Chirac saying, we're gonna raise the price 5% above inflation every year. This is Nicolas Sarkozy coming in uh, as finance minister and put a stop to that increase. I think he might've been affected by Carla Bruni at that time. <laughs> But she quit smoking, but that's the good news. And you see the similar patterns in South Africa. That as consumption uh, was rising, as prices were decreasing, but when they raised the price, consumption fell. But worldwide, taxes are vastly underused. The difference between the cost of cigarettes are, um, around the world is mostly due to differences in underuse of the excise tax in uh, particular developing countries. Now, one of the concerns that are raised when you raise when you do raise taxes is you're going to whack it to the poor, but you have to look at the totality of the evidence, which suggests that the health consequences are more heavily concentrated in the poor. So, if we take, for example, in Canada, up until uh, about 1996, in the lowest income uh, neighborhood of men, 35% would be dead before age 70. You know, 35 year olds versus 20% in the highest income. 
And but of that, um, smoking accounted for about a third in the poorest group, but a smaller proportion in the highest group. So if you take away the shaded bar, the inequalities between rich and poor in Canada can actually be substantially reduced. And we've now got evidence in Ontario that actually that has happened. The inequalities are reducing because of tobacco control. Okay, the other concern is what about the financial harm? So this is an analysis of uh, smokers worldwide. It's a little bit complicated, but let me just walk you through this. So what you do is you compare the five income groups from the poorest to the richest. And uh, what are the differences in 13 countries with about 500 million smokers uh, in the baseline smoking prevalence? Well, there's some differences, not huge, but when you raise the tax, because the poor respond more to price, the poor quit more. So the ratio is quite substantial. The, the bottom quintile gets a lot more of the benefit than the richer quintile. What about in terms of averting disease cost? If they don't have things like Medicare, you have to pay for services out of pocket, and that can make families very poor. So that in fact is greater in, the benefits are greater in the poor than in the rich. So overall, taxes aren't necessarily harmful for the poor, and we know that they actually would substantially improve public health. A tripling of the excise tax in every country would reduce consumption by about a third and avoid 200 million deaths this century. This is an example of South Asia. That, you know, if you had a substantial increase, um, you could avoid a substantial numbers of deaths. Why okay. don't they do that? Hmm? Why don't they do that? Because the tobacco industry uh, is very powerful and earns a lot of money, and they have a lot of political uh, clout in this debate. So it's a matter of taking on the tobacco industry. My mother died in one time. Oh, it was very unfortunate, yeah. So I've talked mostly about taxes, but there are other interventions that really reduce smoking. And one of the nice things that we've done in, in Canada were these uh, prominent pictorial warnings. And uh, Australia has gone further by having what's called plain packaging, which is basically the only advertisement for the brand is here, Winfield Blue. The rest is all counter advertising. And this is what uh, Jane Philpott, uh, when she was health minister, has, or the Canadian government has uh, moved to, that Canada will move to this. But these were also effective. There were some studies that showed that if you gave a package of these to a man, uh, they would hand it back and say, no, give me the one that says it's going to kill me. Because, you know, they'd rather be dead than impotent. <laughs> Okay, so this is a bit of the stuff we're doing at the University of Toronto to uh, expand uh, these research approaches. So one of them is to basically take the million death study approaches that have worked successfully in Canada or in India, excuse me, and, and basically export them. So we now have partnerships, um, oh, that's out of date, it should be Ethiopia, Mozambique, and Sierra Leone that we're working with the Gates Foundation to expand. And the goal is to try to get a lot more countries to take this up. And we are trying to do a, a global commission on tobacco control that would try to accelerate taxes in all of the countries. So let me conclude again with the two key messages. Large declines are possible in the 21st century if we act on evidence and that the basic epidemiology and counting the dead describing causes is central to understanding that. If you'd like more information, <coughs> Please do uh, go to our uh, website, uh, which uh, has all of the materials available. If you would like to enroll in a course which edX is offering, um, which should be up and running next week or so, it was featured in the Globe and Mail, but I'll, I'll put in a plug for it, called Death 101 edX. So it's about, uh, it's very much covering the same kind of materials, but in greater detail. It's about a six week course that covers key topics in the evolution of mortality. And that'll be available from February 1st free on the edX uh, platform. Thank you, I'm happy to take more questions. Great, thank you. May I suggest that you call on people, but I propose the best thing is for people to come up here. <laughs>
because the sound is not as good back there and we couldn't hear you last week. So if you want to ask a question, come up to the microphone, uh, ask a, qu a quick question, and, and then, you know, he'll answer it how long, however long he wants to, but uh, then take your seat. So, uh, maybe you want to, several of you kind of get up. Or if you want to just stay there, just I'll repeat your question in the microphone. All if right. you prefer to stay in your warm seats. <laughs> So all these statistics, and I never saw sleep apnea. And sleep apnea is a big cause of death in many countries. And in developed countries, there is sleep apnea machine they prevent, but many countries, I guess, is hidden. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. The, the question is, how common is sleep apnea as a cause of death in high-income countries uh, and in low-income countries? Um, it's increasingly recognized in high-income countries, that uh, sleep disturbance is uh, an important de determinant, not necessarily of mortality, but certainly of morbidity and you know, poor uh, uh, psychologic function the next day. In developing countries, we just don't know enough. Interestingly, the leading risk factor that has been identified for sleep apnea is smoking. Obesity. Obesity, Obesity also goes with it, yeah. Okay, the back. Um, I have questions. Um, the first obvious one in Canada is uh, are the uh, is like an increases in consumption of, of, of marijuana going to reverse some of the gains made by the decrease in tobacco consumption? So the question is will increases in marijuana in Canada uh, reverse the gains in that are seen for, uh, for tobacco? Well the truth is we don't know what we do know is that the likely levels of marijuana use are not going to be at the, uh, the same levels that have been identified uh, in terms of cigarette use. In early uh, adolescence, at the experimental stage, uh, marijuana use has now become as common as cigarette use. But you have to remember kids aren't human and they are testing and exploring these, the long-term dependence on uh, marijuana appears to be less, in part because, well, compared to cigarettes, in part because cigarettes were designed by the industry to addict and keep you addicted. Provided, I'm not, a, I'm not personally a fan of marijuana legalization, I am a fan of decriminalization and of regulation, but I don't think we should be encouraging the widespread uh, use of basically a combustible product, which probably does cause harm. Unlike tobacco epidemiology, we don't have long-term studies of marijuana users in large numbers. However limited studies are available, for example, among the, uh, the veterans that went to uh, the veterans from the Vietnam War, in those that have used marijuana lifelong, they clearly have excesses of particular conditions and they have excess rates of suicide. So this idea, I never buy this argument, which many people says that, oh, you know, somehow medical marijuana is good for you. I think it's an appropriate point to say that the government spending extraordinary amounts of resources to crack down on the criminality of it has been a real waste, having it properly regulated um, and but and quite restricted is important, and that includes keeping basically big marijuana out of the picture. You don't want this in a stage where what happened with a cigarette, where Philip Morris and others decided that they could engineer a product that would addict and kill, uh, and they would just keep recruiting more replacements. That would be the wrong way to go. But I don't think the trajectory of where regulation is going to lead to that. But nor is it that we should be saying, oh, this is great stuff. Let's make it available to everyone, completely decriminalize it, uh, or completely deregulate it. That, I think, is nonsense. You had a second question, sir. Yeah, the second one is, is much more limited. I mean, um, most countries, this uh, concerns the, uh, the uh, effect of taxation. <clears throat> uh, most countries uh, have a pretty good control over 
the taxation of tobacco. Mm. Uh, with Canada, that's not entirely the case because there are a couple of uh, loopholes through which illicit tobacco yeah. slips in, and it's actually quite sizable. Um, it's just a comment. Sure. Uh, yeah. So the comment is uh, particularly about the uh, smuggling that occurred in uh, in Canada um, and the how much of control does the Canadian government actually have on that? I think you raise a very good example. Uh, and the Canada was uh, very much the, the wag the dog experiment for the tobacco industry, because what they've done is try to showcase the Canadian uh, tax reversal as an example of what happens when you raise taxes. But the full story you should probably understand because it's important. Well, what happened? Well. The, uh, there were, uh, there are indigenous uh, or Aboriginal reserves that have declared, no, we're not supposed to be taxed on various uh, products. The tobacco industry, Rothmans in Canada, worked actively with them. So they would do things like they would, ex uh, you know, the Canadian cigarette brand Export A, the, the market size in Canada was whatever, 20 million or so, but they would produce five times that and they would export it to the US where no one smokes this stuff. And when they export it, it's tax-free. Then they got into coots with uh, these uh, tribes, basically the criminal tribes, to smuggle it back. They uh, were very proud of this because they were keeping market share, scaring Paul Martin into trying to reduce the tax. And then they call the CBC and say, hey, there's a smuggling run across the St. Lawrence River, so send your cameras up. And the CBC is covering it, everyone's all panicked. So it was all a staged stunt by the tobacco industry. When the later, Paul Martin, uh, when they reduced the taxes, what happened? Well, consumption in youth went up and the revenues dropped. And thankfully, the bureaucrats in Ottawa are sensible. They said, we made a big mistake and they went back and raised taxes. More imp importantly, they got the RCMP to go after the tobacco industry. And the tobacco industry settled uh, out of court with the Harper government for a billion dollars for its role in abetting uh, smuggling. That's a bargain. They should have, you know, by some estimates, they should have paid 10 times or 20 times that. So worldwide, if you look at this, the evidence is very clear that higher prices and taxes don't determine smuggling. What the main driver is the tolerance for criminality and the criminal networks that smuggle. You know, not, we're not talking about going to the border and I get a pack. We're talking about truckloads that are full of cigarettes. And you know, you don't do that unless you're uh, a professional criminal who thinks, oh, this is a good market to get into for, uh, for cigarettes. Um, so. What, uh, and we know that where people have cracked down on those networks, like in Spain, and kept the taxes high, they've actually got rid of smuggled products. Now, just to the last point on Ontario, it's a political problem because people are scared of, the politicians are scared of what the First Nations groups might do. But uh, it's just really quite ridiculous. Just next door to us, um, in uh, Manitoba, they made a very simple deal with the native reserves. They say, you know what, forget the tax-free status. You pay the tax, but keep track of the sales. And at the end of the year, the government is going to pay you back with a premium. And they went along with that because the money then goes to the council, which you know they use for as they see fit. So they could use that solution here. It's just the concern about uh, not reaching that. And Ontario taxes are like behind the rest of the country because of this political failure. And um, you see this, it's well organized. You remember there was some discussion of raising the tax and the TTC was flooded by these red signs, the coalition against smuggling of tobacco. You know, all these people are concerned about smugglers. You think, oh, these are, this, this is great. It's the tobacco industry. They're paying front men uh, to put these ads up and try to scare people. So it's just, it's an incredible, it's a Hollywood stunt that we've been in the middle of. And, you know, I think people need to really understand that uh, that's not a uh, reason for the excuse on really raising taxes and having a fair discussion
with the First Nations group saying, you're not going to be part of something that causes an extraordinary amount of deaths in Canada and move to the Manitoba solution. You know, it's just, it's political will. And I mentioned this to Eric Hoskins and others, and it's just a question of how tough, tough con constituency to take on, but eventually they'll have to. Well, it's, it's a very good point. Uh, it's a very elegant solution because then you drive along and you are through many uh, reservations in Ontario. You see the signs all over that says cheap smokes. Yeah, cheap smokes, yeah. yeah. Sorry, you had a question from the web. Yeah, um, we have a question that's come in from the UK. Uh, so what does your mission at the World Bank um, consist of as a specialist and is it still going on? Is, is that either World Bank or World Health Organization? Oh, okay. Well, I've question. worked in both. So I, the question yeah. is, what did I do at World Bank and WHO? Well, yeah. uh, at the World Bank, I tried to get them to take tobacco seriously. Uh, and uh, I fought lots of economists to try to get them to take tobacco seriously. And mostly, uh, you know, I won. The World Bank did change its opinion on what they do on tobacco taxes. So I spent five years there. And I was at uh, WHO for three years where I worked on the commission on um, <coughs> um, uh, macroeconomics and health, which is mostly focused on increasing, uh, well, the closest thing that we would work on was the avoidable mortality work that I showed you earlier, um, trying to see how all countries could accelerate their premature mortality reductions. I did that, and then I found a proper academic job back in Canada. There is a second part to the question, though, about whether your mission is continuing. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm still working with the World Bank um, and with WHO. I'm trying to get the World Bank to do more on tobacco. I'm trying to get the WHO to count the dead. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, comment and question. I found it curious that you, you cited the cause of obesity, for instance. Uh, and this gets into definitions, I guess, because nobody writes obesity of a death certificate as a cause of death, but yet it seems to factor in here, which, which I think these are secondary effects of the primary behavior, you know, with diabetes and heart disease and stroke, which is all caused by that, but yet you cited obesity as opposed to those other. Just interesting comment about definitions. But my, my real question is, though, uh, I, I didn't see anything about political economies and influence on longevity. For instance, uh, is there evidence to say that, uh, you know, social democracies with single payer health care systems and less <laughs> reliance on private enterprise mm -hmm. are free market countries, you know, do they have a higher death rate than those who have a more mixed economy? Okay. So the comment was on how do you define obesity as a cause of death? Um, and I'll deal with that first. So, what we're describing here are the risk factors for death, which you can study in um, in mortality studies. You, there's a couple of ways you can observe people who are healthy and follow them up until they die. What's called core studies or prospective studies, and that's where you measure obesity most reliably. Mm -hmm. We're experimenting with simple things where you actually, after the person has died, you show a simple diagram of what their body shape was when they were uh, at, let's say, 10 years younger. And that seems to be actually pretty predictive, at yeah. least of central obesity. Uh, so there are ways of, of studying this. And there's a separation here, right, between the cause of death, like a heart attack, and whether the person was obese or not. So these are dealing with risk factors. For, risk factors. Yes. So your second question is, what about political economy? And is there uh, a benefit of living in democracies and in uh, in places that have uh, uh, more universal <laughs> health coverage. I think the answer broadly is in places that have a more universalist approach to health tend to have better performance. So if you contrast Canada and the US by almost all the metrics um, that we have, when we have reason to complain about a healthcare system as many of you uh, sure have uh, encountered the frontline medical services, emergency services in Canada, I think continue to be quite poorly organized. But um, you effectively, 
the macro indicators suggest the essential outcomes are actually better in Canada than they are in the U.S., even among those that have private insurance in the U.S. So the determinants here in terms of what are the drivers of political economy are a commitment to universalism um, and making sure everyone is covered. Not everything is covered, but everyone is covered. And the other uh, determinant, which I think is the case, is strong public health programs um, that uh, borrow from what we've learned of how to reduce infectious diseases but are applied to adult risk factors are required. And uh, even in Canada, I think we do a pretty poor job of those. There are other constituencies that have done well. Take a very simple thing, which was the introduction of the human papillomavirus vaccine for adolescent girls to try to wipe out uh, cervical cancer. Well, in Ontario, they introduced it, and I remember at the time sitting with the uh, chief medical officer saying, look, you, you've got a chance here to just uh, study what happens, just make sure everyone is, uh, they have to write their OHIP number on that form, and they can only opt out of it by filling out another form. But I'm sorry to say that some privacy commissioner or someone here said, oh, no, no, that's going to be a problem. And we missed a chance to study what's been the impact. In Australia, they have. Mm -hmm. And what they've shown in Australia is they were able to show big reductions in cervical cancer very quickly within 10 years of introducing the vaccine. But more importantly, they have a way of tracking. So they know which women doesn't have it, which are the potential risk population so they can get to universalism. Right. So it's, I think the common element is where you've got strong public health programs and a commitment. And the best example, which is a sad one unfolding to the south of us, is the stagnation of white middle-aged mortality um, and the opioid mortality crisis. You see that kind of unfolding so in fact, we're going to turn our attention to looking at U.S. mortality data and really trying to understand these same kind of patterns. I think those are the main drivers. Is democracy healthier? Well, look at the huge reductions in China. You know, if you look at, if you crudely say 5 to 49, and you rank these countries from, you know, nice places to live to not so nice or autocratic, you wouldn't see much of a relationship. Ethiopia is by no means uh, a democracy, but right. big declines. Iran isn't, but big declines. But you know, and then India, which is a democracy, is comparable. So there isn't a direct correlation with democracy and, and mortality. Okay, great presentation. Question? Um, another IT question, uh, another question from the web. IT question, how do you gather all your data with your role at Institute for Clinical Evaluative Sciences? Uh, this, these aren't ISIS data. The question is, where do I get the data? These aren't yeah. ISIS data. So these are from our own studies, and they're drawn heavily from the UN Population Division publicly available data, and uh, from large collaborative networks um, that we uh, that we share data. Thank you. Yep, at the back, sir. Um, these are protocols for former heart patients. Aspirin, cholesterol, and also blood pressure pills, which are not for blood pressure, but for heart function. But the insurance companies ask those questions, whether you're taking those, and can disqualify you based on taking blood pressure pills. Maybe insurance companies? They can disqualify you for taking blood pressure pills, but you're not taking them for blood pressure. So the questions that insurance companies have constructed are totally faulty and deficient and almost penalize anybody who has had a heart attack. The question is uh, insurance companies appear to penalize people who are taking blood pressure pills. Uh, I didn't know that. Uh, if they were, it would be a big mistake. Uh, yeah. But they think you're taking it for blood pressure, which you aren't. So the question doesn't ask what you're taking assuming you're taking it for blood pressure. Yeah. So that's how faulty those questions are. And it's actually the insurance companies are doing it backwards because if you're trying to insure someone, 
the one you'd want is the people who are taking the three pills, that's right? They yeah. want improvements and healing. Yeah. But if you're taking it, that's a mark of you. I'm not a mark for you. I wasn't aware of that, but you should certainly write to the, uh, uh, the yeah ministry and ask them to to try to get the insur the insurance actuaries that put this together probably aren't aware of this evidence. No. Yes. What is your new job, please? I used to use What is your job right now? My job. Yeah. Okay, I'm the director for the Center for Global Health Research, which is at St. Michael's mm -hmm. Hospital. And I'm a University of Toronto professor of global health and epidemiology at the at the Dalalana School. How can you influence the government then? Uh, by rubbing their noses in data. That's what I do. <laughs> no, that's good though. Yeah, I I don't uh, uh, hang around politicians. My father is a retired politician. He got me really quite off politics. So oh, I really? uh, I just try to produce data and. They hopefully will, it'll get to them in one way or the other. Well, get them to understand what you're saying, though. Let's hope, yeah. No, because it's very important what you were saying. Well, thank you. So, mm -hmm. the government, they take care about the cigarettes, they do taxes, they pay back, but they don't do anything about, for example, that the hormones in uh, the chicken or the food. That causes death as well. Yeah. The question is, what about things like hormones and food and others? Well, you, we have to be careful about what we can quantify. And when there has been efforts, um, Richard Pito and Richard Dahl led one on the U.S. data in 1981 to quantify the major known risk factors. And the conclusion was that smoking was as important as all of the rest combined. When you look at it carefully, um, we, you know, the, yes, uh, hormonal things in, in uh, chicken and others, I mean, we try to avoid that personally. That's a personal choice, you know, get free run eggs, uh, free range eggs and so forth. But uh, we don't have any evidence uh, that those are causing very large effects at the population. If they are, there would be quite obesity, small effects. Obesity is uh, is more complicated. We The truth is, I mean, the world is getting fatter. We only know a little bit about why that's occurring. We certainly know that there's an important role for, for uh, sugary uh, drinks. Mm -hmm. We do know that there's an important role for um, refined uh, carbohydrates, uh, you know, sugary carbohydrates that are encouraging. And we do know that it's a role of basically, uh, particularly in low income parts of, I mean, this happens in low income Toronto, but also in uh, particularly in the US, just the pricing of uh, the food is such that the healthy stuff costs more than the the unhealthy stuff. Organic almost three times more expensive. Yeah, so uh, if you look at you know fruits and vegetables, they're uh, much more expensive. And I remember when I came uh, to Canada, I was this this remarkable thing. You know, McDonald's at that time had that sign, and they used to actually change it. How many millions served? They only had at that time 32 million served, and they'd be happy when they updated to 50 million served. At that time, the burger at McDonald's was selling for a buck. We thought, wow, this is still, that's amazing. You know, you come as a, as a uh, an immigrant kid and you go to McDonald's, you think this is fantastic. If you go to, today, you can get a burger at McDonald's for about a buck. So how is it that with, you know, yeah. what it should do in, you know, inflation terms, it should be costing at least uh, uh, three, four times that. But so we do have an issue that the prices for the unhealthy foods and the availability um, is far, far greater. So that broadly explains the obesity uh, epidemic, but not completely. There's other things. My friend David Jenkins thinks that, well, it perhaps might be a much more profound disturbance in all of our sleep patterns and other things going on. So we don't know enough about why people get obese. We are now learning about the consequences of obesity, which I showed you, but we don't know enough about why people get obese. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, last uh, question to you, sir. How do you isolate a factor when there are many factors that cause uh, death? In various proportions, how do you dissect those proportions and analyze them when, and say that uh, it's caused by one factor is, is more prevalent when that person died because of the synergy of different factors? Well, you don't uh, do that at an individual level. Um, you, you can only do that at a population level by studying large groups of numbers of people. Oh, sorry, the question is, how do you tease out different factors that contribute to death? So you can only do that at the population level. You know, and I'll give you a practical example. Uh, this actor, Michael Douglas, um, uh, contracted throat cancer and it got treated and he seems to be okay, um, which is the most important thing. But he claimed that it was because of uh, HPV and that he was uh, performing a lot of oral sex in the 80s. He said, that's my cause. What do you think? This is, what's, I mean, it's just the first instance was what? Because he also said he was a heavy drinker and a heavy um, smoker. So now all three of those could be the causes of disease in in him. We don't know which one. The only way you would know is how important those risk factors are by studying, you know, a thousand or ten thousand Michael Douglases and ten thousand controls, and seeing what are the differences in their exposure to each of those. So you can establish the causality or the association strongly only at the population level. You can't in an individual say, oh, this was the particular reason that this disease occurred. Um, and that's just the nature of epidemiology, but it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a cautious one. It's, it means when you, have, you make that claim that something is causing, it's quite a rigorous one, and it's not made lightly in epidemiology. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, ma'am. I'm, I'm just wondering about cancer, like secondhand smoke. Yeah. That, a lot of people die of cancer or get breast cancer or whatever. I don't know which one, mostly lung cancer, I guess, that don't have exposure to, or don't smoke. So, yeah. and, the, the and second hand, uh, the question is second hand smoking effects in cancer. That's uh, the WHO's estimates is that there are 6 million people killed by smoking and 600,000 killed by passive smoking. That cannot be right. It can't be a 10 to 1. Uh, kind of ratio. Mm -hmm. Where there's been careful studies, for example, of long-term flight attendants that work for many years when they used to have smoking mm -hmm. on airlines, they do see an excess of lung cancer, but nothing of this range that I showed you for active smoking. And for almost all of the other major diseases, uh, we see any only small effects, if that. And for breast cancer, there really isn't if you do the epidemiology carefully. If you ask uh, women before they get sick and follow them up um, in terms of exposure, there's no association with breast cancer. But if you ask after they develop breast cancer to remember whether they were exposed, you find you know, a bit of recall bias and you find an association. So there really isn't anything for smoke, passive lung, smoking. Lung cancer. For lung cancer, it's the same, only in certain populations, for example, uh, bar workers or airline stewardesses, or you know, in some cases, those that were heavily exposed to high amounts. But uh, the wife of a, um, uh, a chronic long-term long smoker that didn't smoke herself might have a very small risk, but it's so small that the epidemiology can't measure it reliably. So, but now there's rules about smoking and even within, you can't stay on the property. You have to yes, go yeah. So I think those rules on uh, secondhand smoking are good because uh, they uh, protect non-smokers from the nuisance at least. And importantly, we should be honest about this in public health, they help smokers because mm -hmm. you get more cessation yeah, yeah. by uh, having non-smoking um, areas. So, you know, when it's minus 15, a smoker won't want to go from their office outside. So it actually increases cessation rates. That's right. Yeah. Uh, another question? Tell us your Twitter handle and the story behind it. My Twitter handle, uh, the question is my Twitter handle. My uh, Twitter handle is count the dead. 
Uh, oh, really? And, you know, and that's, I thought I showed it right at the beginning. Uh, that's what I do. I, I'm interested, I'm professionally obsessed with uh, uh, sex and death. And um, <laughs> when I moved to University of Toronto, I, there's my Twitter handle. Uh, David Naylor, uh, who recruited me, uh, offered me a, a Canada Research Chair, and uh, so he said, well, what do you want to be called? And I sent in my form, can I be called Professor of Sex and Death? And he said, no, you need another title. <laughs> uh, but as a compromise, I said, well, I'm going to be focusing on counting the dead worldwide. <laughs>